everybody. Uh, you can hear me, I assume. Well, it's a pleasure to be asked to uh, give a talk at the ASP colloquium. I think it's one of the greatest things that NCAR does is to put on these colloquia. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I know that you come from many different disciplines, uh, so I'll try to be um, uh, lack of jargon and just try to be very uh, simple in the messages that I want to convey. And of course, stop me at any point. Uh, it would be great to have a lot of uh, interaction as we go along. So I'm going to focus my talk on North America, but I think what I have to say is more general um, and can apply to any uh, region of the globe, um, at least uh, uh, qualitatively, but particularly for the extratropical continents. Um, so you can think of Eurasia or uh, other, other regions uh, just, as, just as well as North America. So uh, the first part of the talk will focus on uh, projections, future climate uh, changes uh, over North America in the next 50 years. And then at the end of the talk, we'll actually uh, come more to the present day and uh, look at uh, the trends, the changes that we've uh, observed in our own climate uh, system and uh, try to uh, revisit those in light of what we learn uh, from, from the first part of the talk. So I wasn't here, unfortunately, on Tuesday. And I know you've had a lot of introduction to uh, uh, um, different components of uncertainty uh, in climate change projections. So if some of this repeats what you've heard, uh, you can just uh, tune out. Um, but I just try to start very simply with a schematic of uh, uh, climate change. Um, of course, we have uh, change in the mean state uh, that we expect due to our uh, anthropogenic uh, emissions of greenhouse gases and the like. But of course, uh, we know that there's a lot of variability in our climate system. And really, uh, it's better to thinking of this change as just a change in distributions. So a distribution of climate uh, states in the present day and in the future. And in some way, um, you have to pay as much attention, I think, to uh, the change in the mean as well as uh, the width of this distribution, the uncertainty. Because really, the signal to noise, you know, how, how well we can detect uh, the uh, climate change forced by the greenhouse gas increases is actually the ratio of the change in the mean divided by uh, the width of the distribution. So the signal to noise, one is actually equally interested in, in uh, how big the uncertainty is relative to how big uh, the change in the mean state is. So some people's noise uh, is uncertainty. Mine is the signal. And that's what I want to uh, really focus on today. So I'm sure this repeats what you've heard already, but uh, it's useful to uh, think of three classes of uncertainty in our climate change projections. One has to do with that we really don't know uh, really what, uh, how strong we are going to perturb uh, the radiative balance of the planet. And that depends on how much uh, greenhouse gases we emit, changes in stratospheric ozone, uh, volcanic aerosols, uh, sulfate aerosols, changes in land use, and black carbon, et cetera. So we really uh, can't say with certainty you know, what path we're on for the future um, in terms of the forcing. So that is obviously one, one component. Then the second has to do with the fact that our models are incomplete representations of reality. Uh, we don't have the full physics. We can't possibly actually. Uh, uh, get the full physics at the scales uh, needed. So we have to make some, some uh, parameterizations. Um, and uh, there are differences in the way models are configured. Some may not have uh, certain components of the climate system represented. Uh, they're all uh, configured maybe at a different resolution in space and in the vertical and in time. And they may have different representations of physical processes. So model differences, for sure. I think we've been focused on that that can really play a role in uncertainty. 
And then the last component, which I think has been overlooked, but I think is coming now uh, to the fore, is the fact that there's a lot of unforced variability in the climate system. You can think of El Nino as a prime example. We cannot predict El Nino uh, beyond, you know, maybe if we're lucky six months ahead of time, but certainly not a decade out. We can't say 10 years from now in a certain year that there will be an El Nino event. So, um, and these, uh, this kind of variability has global impacts. Um, and so this is the, the variability that is not tied to a change in the greenhouse gases or volcanic eruptions. It just occurs uh, kind of randomly throughout the system. And this can derive just from the atmospheric motions, which are very chaotic, uh, the dynamics of the atmosphere. Uh, the ocean can give us also some internal variability on a lower, uh, longer time scales, de decades and longer. And then, as I mentioned, uh, El Nino is a prime example of how the coupling between the ocean and the atmosphere can also lead to uh, internal variability. So our, uh, our community has run these IPCC assessments, uh, the last of which was just released uh, in this year. And uh, so um, just uh, to give a sense for how these components of uncertainty have been addressed in the IPCC literature, um, the issue of uncertainty due to uh, forcing, I think, is, uh, has, we have a good handle on that to some extent, because each climate model has been, or many of them, have been run with different scenarios of um, changes in radiative forcing. So we have some handle on what the spread is amongst the different uh, models due to, due to changes in forcing. And then uh, we're very lucky, very fortunate, that we have so many models um, across the world um, to bear on this problem of climate change. And so I'd say uh, you know, we're adequately, at this point, I think, um, uh, able to assess uncertainty that is due to differences, structural differences amongst models. Uh, there are now um, maybe some 44 models, if um, maybe not all independent, but roughly 44 models in this latest um, IPCC assessment. And then this last one, internal variability, that's the tricky one. And the reason that it's tricky is that you actually need a lot of simulations with the same model to adequately um, assess how much of your signal is actually coming from internal multi-decadal variability. Um, and unfortunately, these last two assessments, um, most models only ran a couple of simulations. And so as you'll see as the talk unfolds, that this really is not adequate uh, for for um, bracketing the uncertainty that is due to the internal variability. So that's what I will focus on in this talk. Yes? I know that in symmetry there were some uh, number of control runs mm. uh, with uh, like sta under stationary climate. Yes. But was it for all the mo of the models that? I uh, actually that is a very good point. Thank you. So there are long control runs of I'd say the majority of climate models, and these are runs where there is no change in the external forcing. Greenhouse gases are kept at a certain state, uh, etc. And so from this, you can learn a lot about the internal variability in the system. And that is a very nice way, actually, to assess uh, the importance of this multi-decadal variability. And how about uh, CMIP-5? Uh, again, the same is true for CMIP-5. For, like for most of the models there? Uh, most of the models, I would say there are multi-century uh, control runs here at NCAR. We have um, control runs that are maybe 2,000 years in length. Many of the, uh, maybe half a dozen of the models have control runs of order 1,000 years. So you can learn a lot about the internal variability from those runs. The hard thing is that uh, it, you, don't have you don't have enough runs with, with the change in the forcing as well. 
And so it's a little problematic to um, separate the anthropogenic signal. That's right. That's right. So when you say greater than three simulations, yeah. what's changing in each Or less than three, yeah. Uh, less than three yeah, no, I'm just reporting that uh, the models, that the simulations that were part of these uh, assessment reports, uh, the majority of models only had a few, a few uh, runs, simulations of the future climate. Changing all the changing, sources of uncertainty. Exactly, okay. changing all the forcings. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you for the questions. So let me give you some examples of multi-decadal variability in the real world, um, just to show that you know it exists and it's prominent. So these are two examples that are uh, kind of uh, well known uh, among the uh, people in the climate community. Uh, the first is termed the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. I'm sure many of you have heard of this. And it's simply uh, a, a record of the uh, sea surface temperatures averaged over the entire North Atlantic from the equator up to uh, Greenland, Iceland, and uh, after removing the global mean uh, sea surface temperature. And you can see fluctuations, the cold, cold period in the early part of the century, 20th century, followed by several decades of warmer temperatures, et cetera. And this looks like a fairly uh, regular oscillation, and you might think it's predictable. And uh, there's a lot of work being done on, on the extent to which this is predictable. Um, but just to note that there are multiple decades in which the uh, temperatures in the North Atlantic can be either above normal or below normal. And in the Pacific, we have actually kind of a similar uh, phenomenon um, termed the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And here the record is uh, a little bit more complex. I don't need to go into the details. But just think of, think of it as the uh, counterpart for the North Atlantic. And again, uh, the individual red and blue bars, that's just the monthly mean temperatures after removing the global mean. And you can see that uh, they cluster in, in, in terms of sign. And you can have uh, two or three decades in which we're in a, a warm or a cold state. And in fact, right now, we're in a, in a cold state. And that actually uh, has been implicated in the slowdown of the global warming uh, signal. So are these temperatures or are these indices in this case? Uh, these, are, these are actual, the first one is a direct temperature. This is, a, this is also a temperature index, but it's been, I think, standardized, so the units uh, maybe aren't so meaningful. It's just to give you a qualitative sense for that there is multi-decadal variability in the real world. So in the ocean, it looks very smooth. And you might think these are oscillatory, and we can you know, predict the next warm or cold states, uh, which uh, gives you a misleading impression. And it, actually, uh, they're, they're not regular. Um, and it's actually very difficult to predict them um, you know, uh, long, uh, out uh, beyond about a decade. So in the atmosphere, uh, things are a little bit more chaotic. So these are two leading indices of the atmospheric circulation. Um, uh, and just picking out the wintertime season. Um, and the top one is this North Atlantic oscillation, a pressure difference um, uh, uh, across uh, the North Atlantic. And the bottom one is a similar thing uh, for the Pacific. And again, it's not to give you, the details don't matter. It's just to illustrate that there are time periods in the atmospheric circulation, the wind patterns, where you can have below normal or above normal strength in, in, the, in the winds. Um, even in the atmosphere. So, so there's a lot of multi-decadal variability. So what I mean by, uh, you know, if you have short records, um, you might, if your record stopped in 1990 here for the North Atlantic, you might say, oh, we have this strong upward trend. Hmm, maybe it's, it's forced by the change in greenhouse gases. And people in the community, actually, uh, there are many papers written about that. Um, shortly after, uh, uh, during the uh, late 90s. 
And of course, nature is not uh, going to be so simple. And in fact, I think you really have to look at these patterns as being you know, uh, really largely internally generated and not forced uh, by the change. Uh, well, um, I'll, I'll, let's just go along. Um, I think there's a very, uh, yeah. Uh, we're not sure about it, but I think we're um, uh, realizing now that um, this has to be taken into account. I mean, you could say the same thing. If you have, the whole point is short records are very dangerous to make any conclusions about climate change. So, you know, a lot of people analyze 50 years worth of data. So in the Pacific, let's say your, your record starts in 1950, and maybe it ended in, in the year 2000. 50 years, long time. And we see this downward trend in this particular index. Again, you might be tempted to find a mechanism, an explanation for that. And the important thing is, you know, that is limiting, very limiting, to look at just a 50-year record. And going back in time to the extent that we can, we really see that actually this is not, you know, a monotonic trend. In fact, it's part of a, uh, a sequence of variability. I wouldn't even call it oscillation because that implies some regularity, but it's a, it's just part of variability. And and I think, you know, if there's a single take-home message, that's my message. <laughs> You know, if you have a record that's 50 years long, you might think that's long enough when you see a trend to interpret it as being caused by a change to, uh, in the radiative uh, balance, say, due to a change in greenhouse gases. And that, I think, is a very dangerous um, uh, thing to uh, uh, inference. And I just make a point here that, you know, if you toss a coin uh, lots and lots of times, and this is an unbiased coin, and you get you know random sequences of heads and tails, and this is you know uh, AR uh, just a white noise um, stochastic process, but even that <laughs> sequence of heads and tails will give you you know periods where you have you know more tails than heads, etc. Over decades. And again, that's you know not to inter misinterpret that, and so even white noise uh, can give you this apparent multi-decadal variability, even though there's no physics leading to that to that time scale of variability. It's just part of a random process. Very nice paper uh, by Carl Wunsch. Actually, he wrote the paper. Um, uh, looking uh, with with the NAO as as the example, <laughs> because people were really uh, sort of on a bandwagon about how to interpret this upward trend in the NAO, and just to a sober reminder that you know random process uh, can give you uh, uh, instances of this. So I'm not trying to go overboard here. Uh, maybe there is eventually going to be some upward trend in the NAO. Maybe you know, 100 years out, we'll be able to say, yes, that, that a component of this was due uh, to the greenhouse gas forcing. But at this stage, uh, I think uh, you'd be hard pressed to, to say that there's any overall trend uh, during this record. So come back to our simple schematic. So what I'm going to now focus in on is the width of this distribution uh, that is uh, attributable just to the internal variability. So again, there's other sources of, of the uncertainty, forcing, model differences. But I'm, I'm focused here on the internal variability. And I did send out this paper um, just as background reading, and I'll show results from that. And then I'm excited about some new work, uh, part of which uh, has been written up. And this is a paper you can get on my website if you're interested. And then some new work that I haven't, haven't yet uh, published. OK, so now I have to talk about uh, uh, some model experiments that we've done. 
um, to address um, this issue. And we call it the Large Ensemble, or I should say Initial Condition Ensemble Project. And uh, we first did this with an older version of the model, uh, Community Climate System Model version 3, um, some years ago. And I'll just walk you through how these runs were done. So first, this is a you know, complex coupled model. It has the ocean, it has the atmosphere, it has sea ice, it has some representation of the terrestrial biosphere. And this model um, can be integrated forward in time without any change in the uh, greenhouse gases or volcanoes or anything. And that's our control simulation. And you need to have a long run so that the ocean and the atmosphere come into some kind of equilibrium. So that's what's termed here the control run with the greenhouse gas conditions in the, from the pre-industrial time. And then, uh, as other modeling centers do, at some point when you feel like you have an adjusted, you know, the climate model has, is in some equilibrium state, then you run it through the 20th century and we impose uh, the known changes or estimated changes in the radiative forcing. So the volcanoes, the sulfate aerosols, the greenhouse gases, et cetera. And then most models, uh, modeling centers then, again, you, you just uh, continue uh, into the future with some uh, scenario of changes in the greenhouse gases. And you just have one run that takes you into the future. And that's your projection uh, from a particular model. So what we did here is actually, uh, we did 40 of the runs for the future. And uh, 40, there was no magic number. It just had to do with our computer resources that we had at the time and how long we ran these runs. So we got to do 40 of them. And each one of these was uh, forced with the identical change in the greenhouse gases and all the other radiative forcings. And this followed what was called then the SRES A1B scenario. Uh, it doesn't really matter, just a certain uh, change in the, in the radiative forcing through time. So each one is you know, a plausible future trajectory. Um, and we were interested in, in to what extent they diverge uh, after a certain amount of time. Uh, so what's important here is how we initialized each run. So if it was, you know, uh, if, if there was no change done at the beginning of each of these runs, they should just follow the identical trajectory. But we perturbed them just a little bit. And I don't actually have to go into the details of how we've perturbed it. I'll, uh, suffice it to say, uh, you can, we have some new runs where we just change the temperature in the atmospheric column by order 10 to the minus 14 degrees C. OK, this is the butterfly effect. You cannot observe this. And then that's just a way to set you know, some of these nonlinearities in motion. And they grow with time. It's just like making a weather prediction. Okay, you just perturb your initial conditions ever so slightly. And then you just see to what extent you know, chaos takes over and the, and the ensemble diverges. So that, that's what was done here. But this was done for a long period of time uh, to look at um, the ensemble prediction or projection of the future climate state. So the important thing here is that we couldn't predict, uh, you can't predict you know, if you're going to go on this trajectory or this one, because the perturbation in the initial state is so small that you can't possibly uh, predict which one you're on. So each one of these is a plausible state, future. Uh, evolution according to this particular model. And this is Ed Lorenz, uh, who you know smiles benevolently, benevolently on this project, because of course, that's, he's really the father of chaos, uh, atmospheric chaos. So I think he would be very pleased to see this um, type of run. So now I'll come to the first set of uh, maps that I want to show you. And hopefully, they're simple um, to, to digest. Uh, so we'll take a look at the winter time. And we'll look at air temperatures over North America and changes over the next 50 years, roughly, uh, from, from these simulations. 
And the way that I'm uh, evaluating the changes is to take the, the time series of temperature at each point in, in the model, and then I just fit a linear trend using least squares linear re regression. And then I'm plotting the slope of that trend. You can do it other ways. You can take the difference between the last 10 years and the first 10 years. We've done that as well. And you get uh, very similar results. You can do a nonlinear trend. I mean, you can get fancy. Uh, we didn't get fancy, it just a uh, linear trend here. So this is uh, what I call postage stamp maps. You can, <laughs> they're tiny, but hopefully uh, as I go through them, you'll see what they are. So this is temperature just over land, uh, North America here. And C stands for the CCSM model. And the number is just the, the ensemble member, uh, 1 all the way through 40. So here's the 40 members. So these are all uh, you know, possible future changes in the air temperature. Uh, each of these runs was forced with the same, same amount of uh, greenhouse gas uh, increase. So they're all possible uh, future climate states. And you know, from the back of the room, they look very similar. There's more warming up uh, over in Canada and Alaska than there is over the continental uh, contiguous US. Um, but then if you look more closely, if you're really interested in regional, uh, regional uh, magnitudes of warming, then you begin to see that there's actually some sizable differences. So let me just help uh, guide your eye here, just picking out this particular column. Um, of course, there's no, there's no um, uh, reason for the sequence. These are just the runs, 1 through 40, just plotted out here. And so if you just look at this column, so the top one, number 4, actually it's hard to see, but there's actually some blue shading up in the Pacific Northwest. And so that means that, hmm, even though greenhouse gases are, are rising, uh, in, according to this particular run, uh, you know, the Pacific Northwest actually might have slight cooling. Very odd. <laughs> um, and then you look at the one below that, number 10, and in fact, that's uh, you know, uh, a case where there's highly amplified warming uh, over, over Canada uh, and Alaska. And you can just, uh, but then number 16, cooling actually very slight. I mean, not statistically significant for sure, uh, but really very slight cooling in the southeast US. And you can see that you know a lot of them actually have some cooling here or some cooling in this region. And now the, the, warm, the warmest areas and the areas that aren't so warm, you can really see that there's a lot of uh, di diversity. <coughs> coming out here in these ensembles. This was a surprise to us. Yep. It's just fitting a trend during these 50 years. What was the question? The question was what, climatolo <coughs> what climatological period she yeah. was comparing to. And so this is just a trend. <coughs> yep. So I'm looking at 50 years out what the, what the linear change in temperature is. <clears throat> now I see why questions take a while. <laughs> um, you might be getting to this, but I was just wondering if you could give some examples of the types of physics that you're varying across these runs that would produce these different results. So Great just a question. Huh? Sorry. Great question. Oh, thanks. <laughs> There's no change in physics. This is the same model. This is one model, and it's the same change in greenhouse gases. And yet you get this spread. That will get into what causes it. Yeah. Yeah. No change in physics. That's a really important point. So do the different models, climate models, <coughs> capture the internal variability to different degrees? And is there a way to evaluate how well the model can capture natural variability? Right. So obviously that is a key point. Do we trust this spread? Do the models simulate realistic internal variability on these long time scales? And I'll get a little bit to that at the end of the talk. I think that is a very important uh, field of research and a very difficult one.
because our, our observed records, let's just say we're lucky if we have 100 years, and you saw my examples that I showed you. And um, you know, it, there's going to be a lot of uh, large error bars on the uh, observed multi-decadal variability, because we just don't have a lot of examples. And so it's very tricky now to compare you know, models uh, of course, the hope is maybe to use records from paleo, you know, proxies and give us longer records. But it's a very difficult um, endeavor, very challenging. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is very surprising to me because I work with integrated assessment models. I usually use global temperatures. Yeah. And when I plug, for example, observed and then simulated yeah. temperatures, you get usually a uh, structural break in the variance because the observed variance is huge <coughs> and then it goes like half or something like this. No? So it's <laughs> if it's so under um, represented the variance, the observed variance, so how? Yeah. So yeah. I, I think you said global mean temperature. Yeah. So there's a very big distinction here. If I showed you the time series of global mean temperature, from each of these runs, they would lie right on top of each other. The, the differences are minuscule, are, are small. So when you average you know, uh, over a region as large as the globe, then you can see the effect of changing emissions. Oh. And, and, and so that, it's truly you know, global warming. But when you're going to these regional scales, local scales, that's where uh, it becomes much more um, uh, diverse. So what, what you're saying is that actually these models are, be are better for reproducing the variance in local or regional, the regional variance and the global variance? I'm not sure what you mean by better. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, more realistic, I mean. Uh, larger variance, because in global temperatures, when you combine this, the observed and the, then the projections, yeah. you get the variance like this, for example. You mean the interannual? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then when you go to the projections, if the observed one is huge yeah. or big, then you go to the projections and the variance is usually very small in comparison. So what, what you're saying is that these models are better for, for at reproducing the variance in regional scale than yeah. global scale? Or? I don't know. I don't think that's the case for this model, actually. Okay. <laughs> I, I, again, you know, different models obviously have different degrees to which they're, you know, realistic. But this model is reasonable at at the amplitude of the interannual variability, and I'll show you a little bit at the end of that. They're great points. Yeah. Okay. So now we move on. Uh, so now we'll look at a different variable: um, summer rainfall. So the same kind of map, but now we're looking at the changes in the summertime, uh, June, July, August rainfall. <clears throat> so I don't know how well the colors come out here. But um, so the blues are uh, increases in precipitation, and the yellow-brown colors are decreases. Uh, again, the next 50 years, same model, same change in greenhouse gas forcing. And now I think, you know, again, maybe we can highlight uh, a certain set of uh, runs here. And you can almost see just completely opposing uh, trends. <laughs> so again, a great surprise. <clears throat> OK, so how do we understand this? Uh, that's what I want to get to. Uh, so of course, you know, there's lots to be done in just sort of the, the statistics of how big the spread is relative to the forced. But I, I'm interested in really understanding the processes that give rise to this um, diversity. So uh, useful to think about um, what goes into, uh, into the maps that I just showed you. So I've been showing you the, the total change, right? I'm just mapping for you the, the change in rainfall or temperature. So you can decompose that uh, very easily uh, in this model world into the component that was actually forced by changing the greenhouse gas concentrations. 
And then the part that was unforced, I'm calling it free. Um, and you get that component by subtracting the forced from the total. And the way that we get the part that was forced by the change in the greenhouse gas concentrations is simply to average over all of the runs. And uh, the internal variability, the sequence, the, the, the time evolution, the sequence of internal variability is presumably random between the different runs. And so if you have enough of these runs and you average them at each, at each year, that will start to cancel out. And really what you'll be left with is, is the part that's common amongst all of the runs. And it's common because it was forced. It, it was due to the change in the greenhouse gases. So in the model world, very easy to do. Uh, we average just arithmet uh, arithmetic average of the 40 runs. And we call that the signal. That is the, that is the anthropogenic climate change signal. And then what's left over is the part that's the noise. <laughs> that is the part that is the inter due to internal variability um, that is not predictable. So I'll just show you a decomposition for a couple of the runs here that you've seen before. So now we come back to our wintertime air temperature changes. And I've picked out two contrasting runs um, from the 40 from the set of 40 runs that we had. So on the left is what you saw before. These are just the total change in the temperature. This run you know, had slight cooling in the southeast US, and this one has massive warming um, over much of the northern part of the continent. So uh, we go all the way here to the right-hand side, the forced. That's just the average change in temperature over all 40 of the runs. And that we can say that we equate with the anthropogenic climate change signal. And that's, you know, it's the same in both because it's, it's the average of 40 in both. And that gives us what we know from simple physical principles that you, know, you have warming everywhere. There's no doubt greenhouse gases and the buildup of water vapor that goes along with that will warm, uh, warm the globe. Um, and then uh, you can see that the warming increases as you go towards the Arctic. And this is polar amplification, which is another well-known consequence um, of uh, physical consequence um, of the increase in greenhouse gases. Uh, so then you take this map here, and you subtract it from the total. And then that gives you what's left over. And that's the part that was different between the different runs. and that Obviously, that must be due to the internal variability of the climate system. So I've put some numbers on here for you. So these numbers represent the average over, I think it was the contiguous uh, 48 states here, if I remember right. So <coughs> for run number 16, averaged over uh, the contiguous US, uh, we had a warming of 0.8 degrees C. And the forced component actually gives us uh, 2.1, and so the internal is the difference, and you can see there's cooling everywhere. And the magnitude uh, for the US as a whole is actually comparable uh, between the internal part and the forced part. And that's why each of those maps looked pretty different, because they're comparable. So that's the first point here. And then the second point is that the internal, or the unforced part of the change, it's not you know, noise in terms of, you know, one grid box to another. It's not like, you know, Colorado got warmer and then Utah uh, got, got cooler. <laughs> These are very large spatial scales. And so if you're thinking about impacts, um, drought uh, or agriculture, uh, you know, it's, this, is, this is affecting a large portion, a large region in the same way. It's very coherent. Did you do a subsampling of the, the 40 runs to see how many were required in order to produce a pattern of the forced runs, the forced signal there? Yes. That's required? Yes. So we've, we've uh, yeah. So you can estimate, OK, how many runs did we need to come close? And you can define close however you like, you know, within standard deviation or so, uh, to estimate this properly. 
And we have maps of that in uh, a paper in Climate Dynamics in 2012. Um, and for temperature, um, you actually didn't need that many to come within one standard deviation, maybe order three or four, actually. But again, it's, it's you know, what is your tolerance of the magnitude? I, I think it comes down to, you know, what, if you want to know it within, you know, a half a degree or a quarter degree or something like that, then you're going to need more ensemble members. But yeah, you can, you can estimate that. Uh, how confident are you about that fourth part? Like if you had instead of 40, you had 80 runs, do you right. think that could be significantly different? Yeah, um, I haven't actually addressed that, but I think these are, uh, I don't think, no, I don't think you'll, uh, they're going to be very different at all. 40 is plenty. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. You may be coming to this later, but um, for my part, this blows a huge hole in the delta change type studies because we're having the unforced variability in the control period and in the future forced period. So just randomly we can sample extreme end members from either end of that endpoint, calculate our delta, and then apply it to our base climate and hence into our impact model. It, to me, um, blows a bit of a hole in that approach. Agree. I agree. So, so Linda and I have actually been talking a lot about, um, you know, you can take <coughs> these simulations from this large global climate model that's fairly coarse in spatial resolution, and you can use you can use this now as your lateral boundary conditions for a regional model that presumably has you know, better uh, resolution spatially and then also better representation of processes, physical processes, orography, et cetera. And then you can, you know, oh, I guess, downscaling. Um, but what's very important is to, to not take, don't downscale however you want to do it <laughs> from this map because that's not you know, that's, that's part of what we'll witness in the future, but it's only part. <laughs> we don't know what the full, we could witness this map or this map. So if you just downscale from the ensemble mean from a single model with a lot of runs, or the ensemble mean from all the CMIT models, and, and I've made the map, it looks very similar from all the CMIT models. Uh, that's, that's just one component. <laughs> you know, of what we will witness, or I think. And so really, you should downscale from, I think, a range of, of these solutions from the coarse uh, global climate model. And you might get some very different, you know, again, it's just a way of assessing, you know, we know the climate is variable. <laughs> and we have to then, you know, account for that uh, in all of our impacts work. And not do that is is you know it, it's not it's not useful. Um, so I think that is very important. Yep. Um, I was wondering, yep. uh, did you look at if you use different numbers of runs, um, you might detect climate change signal in different future times. Oh, so when does the climate change signal emerge yeah. relative yeah. to the noise? Yeah, we've done we've made some maps of that in the 2012. Uh, climate dynamics paper. So again, you can take all of this and <clears throat> then estimate, okay, knowing how big the force signal is at any given time, and uh, <clears throat> you can then find, uh, you know, the signal to noise at any given time in each member. And then you can estimate, okay, how far in time do you have to go before that signal emerges above the, the noise? So the time of emergence, yep. How would you compare the range of temperature differences between the 40 runs and the range of temperature differences between the different emission scenarios? Are they comparable or? Uh, I haven't done that um, because, you know, then you're, uh, but that, 
that that's a nice thing to do. Um, I haven't done that. Um, uh, but what I have done, and I'll show it a little bit at the end, is to compare maps like this uh, from different models, single run from different models. So then I know that the, the, each model is uh, perturbed, has experienced the same change in the greenhouse gases, so the same forcing. And then to what extent the difference amongst between models how big that is compared to the difference within a model due to the internal variability. And then another step is to then ask, you know, uh, how big these differences are relative to uh, different forcing scenarios. And that's work that should be done, and hopefully, you know, uh, groups will start to do that. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to your opinion of how the impacts kind of um, groups have been using projections data, and if you think that a lot of it has been incorrect, given what you're saying. And from your vantage point, also, if you can then speak to what you think an appropriate usage would be. Um, yeah, so I know those are kind of large questions. But. So, you know, I'm not that well versed in, in, the, in the impacts, uh, all the impacts work, but my understanding is a common thing to do is to take some kind of average, multi-model average, and then, you know, address, okay, how does this, how will this affect um, impacts? And that's just fine as long as you interpret it correctly. <laughs> so that really is going to tell you, all right, what, how will, you know, our change in greenhouse gas emissions, how will that affect whatever impacts you're interested in? But that's not the only thing that, you know, will happen in the future. We're also just having internal climate variability. And that, I think, to my knowledge, hasn't really been uh, adequately addressed. And so that's the difference between, you know, assessing impacts uh, from this run and this run versus assessing impacts just from this average state. And in fact, um, when we, our early stages of this work, uh, caught the attention of a, um, a hydrologist who was studying um, projections of uh, river flow in the Colorado River. And uh, again, the literature was that you know you, you force your hyd hydrological model with a single you know the force change in rainfall and in temperature, and then you see the consequences for the the river flow. Um, and he then went uh, to the CMIP three archive, I think it was, and he just took he just looked at each model individually, and he plotted just the you know the the, the records of uh, rainfall uh, uh, f uh, in the Colorado headwaters from each of the models for the next, whatever, 50 years, 100 years. And he was astounded because there's, you know, as many go positive as go negative. And, and that just hadn't been taken into account. And so then we, we, he, he got in touch with me and, and we realized, you know, it's just, we're just on the same page here. Um, so I think that's what has to be done is it's, you know, if this climate model is realistic and I'm not claiming that, you know, it, it's a perfect model by any means and, and it's very important to evaluate biases, um, but that these, you know, maybe these are extreme members, but they do occur. That's, that's the range that we should be um, planning for uh, in the future. <laughs> so given the way the these model runs are configured would you say that 
this is appropriate for looking at changes in internal variability in the future as well, or just trying to assess the separate components? Mm -hmm. Because I think that's a big issue in terms of impacts is we have a current observed internal variability that we've right. experienced, but would that become more extreme in the future or not? I, right. <clears throat> so we've looked at, yes, you can use exactly this type of run to see, OK, is there more variability at, at some future decade uh, compared to present day in a particular quantity. And um, for sure, that happens in some regions for some variables. Let's say summertime temperature you know, in the uh, interior of the, of the west or something, where soil moisture obviously has large feedbacks on the temperature. Um, or over the Arctic, where the sea ice is thinning and melting and that can uh, change the variability. Um, but uh, I'd say there are more examples of the, uh, of the opposite, where the variability actually doesn't change significantly. But that's something that can definitely be looked at for this type of simulation. Uh, it's, it, it is relatively well known that uh, like the internal variability doesn't depend too much on the nature of the initial perturbation. We could think about the size of the butterfly or maybe its color. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we can buy this idea if we are doing simulation over a few decades or centuries, but over thousands of years, yeah. like this perturbation will continue and eventually affect the state of the ocean. Yeah. So the intermember variability will eventually increase. And I, I, I'm not sure if it is like a big effect, but how can we separate that kind of trend to uh, some changes that we would detect in the internal variability with time? Uh, for example, if we, we would maybe attribute that to the change in greenhouse gases. So you're asking if, if the ocean uh, like the, the perturbation will continue and, and eventually affect the state of the ocean. So the with like thousands of years, yeah. your members will differ by much more than in yeah. the first centuries. Yeah, I don't think that's actually, I think it's the opposite. So the ocean is definitely, uh, I mean, I could show you the ocean temperatures and there, you know, there are definitely differences amongst the members. But I think as time goes on, then the forced signal will start to dominate. Mm -hmm. The internal variability you know, will just diminish as the time scale gets longer. Yeah, but if you look at like the spread uh, as function of time, yeah. so the spread between your members yeah. will eventually increase. Yeah, I guess I've only analyzed it out you know, 50 years or so, and I see the spread diminishing because the forced change becomes large relative to the spread. Maybe we'll move on, but I, I haven't seen evidence of that, but possibly, uh, possibly. OK. And uh, I guess just the same thing here. I don't probably need to belabor this, but this is the decomposition for summertime precipitation. Again, to illustrate, I've taken you know, extreme members, one that has future drying and one that has future um, uh, increases in rainfall. And if you look now at the force change, averaging all over all 40 runs, they're so small <laughs> compared to, compared to the, the unforced part. And so that just tells you that the internal variability for precipitation actually can be a lot larger than the force component. And again, just to reiterate the large spatial scales that you see in the unforced component. So I think, I think we've had such a good discussion. I'm just going to keep it simple. I'm not going to uh, think that's probably smart. Um, but you can make maps of signal to noise. And um, you, know, you hope signal to noise is greater than 2 right? to get. And um, you can, uh, and um, well, all right, here, here are the maps. So these are air temperature and precipitation, wintertime and summertime signal-to-noise maps. And uh, these numbers are just the average, I think, uh, for the contiguous US again. 
And the only thing to note is, you know, temperature, especially in the summertime, the force signal is like three times bigger on average than the internal variability. Yes, this is the 50 year, same 50 year period. But precipitation, less than one. So for the next 50 years, to claim that we're seeing, you know, that we're, maybe a component is due to climate change. I'm not saying, you know, that it's not there, but it's small compared to the internal variability. And we get similar results from a different model that had a 17 member ensemble. Okay, so now I'm going to just uh, qualitatively discuss uh, what I think is a major part of what's going on in creating uh, the spread uh, amongst the different runs of the same model. And that is that the atmospheric circulation has so much uh, variability that, that, you know, you know, we can't predict the next, <laughs> the next hurricane or the next storm. Well, we certainly can't predict, you know, the wind patterns 50 years from now. So there's a lot of, a lot of internal variability in the atmospheric circulation. So again, I'm just going to illustrate it very simply um, with <clears throat> contrasting members from this 40-member uh, ensemble. So here I've picked out um, two, two runs I, I don't think we've uh, looked at in detail before. So again, this is for the winter time. And the, the colors are the air temperature change over the next 50 years. And now the contours are the, the change in the sea level pressure field. So just an index of the strength of the winds. And um, so uh, you can see that over the North Pacific here, this region of vigorous uh, you know, variability uh, in the Aleutian Low, Actually, they have opposite changes. <laughs> uh, I mean, not just different magnitude of the same sign. They are opposite. <laughs> and they are almost the same magnitude. Um, so again, the real world, if this model is realistic, we could see you know, a trend towards a higher pressure. And that will affect rainfall in California, et cetera. Or you know, maybe we'll will witness uh, this particular sequence of internal variability, and that will give us a low. So uh, that just highlights how variable uh, the atmospheric circulation trends, even over the next 50 years, is. And then I've drawn in just schematically uh, sort of the direction of the airflow around these highs and lows. Um, and you can see, so if you have a high, you'll be bringing a uh, tendency for bringing down cooler air from the poles. And you can see this area of slight cooling here uh, coincides with a strong flow from the north. And here, this, this one, you have strong winds from the south bringing up some warm air. And you can see a lot more amplified warming in this region. Yep. Just wondering if these difference in the pressure patterns, is that a function of the time slice 50 years, or do these tend to persist? Will run 29 tend to show a high pressure pattern persisting over the decades, run 6 this low pattern persisting over the decades? Uh, great question. Um, so, if, so if I looked, you know, only looked at the next 25 years, would this run also have a high and that one have a low? I don't actually know the answer to that. Probably to some extent, uh, but maybe not. I, I don't know. So, so, to some extent, these are higher. Doesn't than really matter. <laughs> okay. Ah. Okay. Got it. Lenny's next. So, to some extent, these are these are higher's and lowers, right? Yes. So, absolutely. I mean, it, can we actually see if that arrow? That's not. I mean, if we actually looked at what the and their averages, so they're not actually synoptic p pictures, right. right? So, if we actually looked at the higher plus the background and the lower plus the background. Would they change sign? Is it actually low? No, 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 no. These are not big enough to change the sign. Okay. No, no. Um, one place where the sort of question I think Joel was asking would make a big difference in, in the planning work we do, um, you're often interested in, you know, either warning signs or even situation awareness. Yes. You know, so 
it, it's been dry for two years. It's gonna, yeah, is it going right. to stay dry for the next 10? Um, right. You know, so is, is there I anything? Is in, no here. Yeah, so is there any sort of correlation <laughs> structure yeah. in here that yeah. it has a stronger signal yeah. than what you're showing? So you don't need to know 50 years out right. what it's going to be, but if you could know five years out or even know today where you are, yeah. that would make a difference. So does this say anything about that? You could look at it in these runs. My hunch is uh, there won't be any. Any, uh, so I'm a little worried that the organizers and speakers are driving the discussion more than the students. So <laughs> maybe we could limit our, our uh, comments to the students for the next 15 minutes. <laughs> and then we can get to a broader discussion. At, at Is that enough time for you to finish? You know, I, I'm you... happy to show whatever time permits. I, I'm not tied to, to a lot of this. <laughs> no, we sh I know you are warned. <laughs> No, I, I'm going to. There's much more flexibility than I expected. I'm very happy <laughs> to be good. flexible, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump at some point to um, looking at the observed uh, record. So, so let's. I really uh, want to get some points across for that. So, when you decide to do that, yes. let's try and maybe stop at quarter of. That's 12 minutes from now. Okay. And before that, I jump. Before, well, when do you? I'm asking you what yeah. what you think. Well, I'm just going to finish this, but then I'll finish jump. this and then sure. jump. Then maybe that's, that's a good spot. Okay. <laughs> no, I can wait. Okay. Um, I, I mean, this is a little bit more general. I was actually very, really surprised by the by the results. Uh, I've just begun um, using I mean, climate model data in general. So I'm still learning a lot about you know the properties and. Um, I mean, especially when it comes to future projections. My question is, if I'm trying to look at, say, future projections for drought in North America, yeah. um, and I'm using the CIMIP 5 data that I can find online, right. and I say select, you know, one ensemble, the you know R1, I1, P1. Um, is it? Am I understanding correctly that that ensemble would be just one of the models, one of the runs that you're showing? Sorry. Uh, well, you're, when you're selecting from the CMIP archive, <clears throat> you're selecting a whole bunch of different models, right, including but, this one. Right. So I said, I mean, when I select one model for one scenario, right. um, when I, I mean, one experiment. One, one of these pictures. One of the ensembles would be one of those pictures. That's so right. technically, that technically, I could have 40 different for R1, I1, P1, and they would be different, just like you showed. Uh, that's right. Okay. So, given that I don't have that data in the CIMIP 5 archive, can I use the variability amongst the different models as a proxy for this internal variability? Or exactly what we're going to get to. Okay. That's exactly what you have to th worry about. So here's the decomposition now for the now the circulation and the temperature. So the forced part, and let's just focus on the contours and the contra intervals are consistent amongst all these maps. So here's the forced part. This is due to the change in the greenhouse gases. This model tells us we'll have a ridge building up more strongly in the next 50 years uh, over the west coast of North America. And that's definitely going to affect you know, temperature and precipitation. But that's small. <laughs> There's two contours here compared to the, in, the unforced part. And that's why these maps look so different. So you, th you know, the postage stamp maps that I showed you for temperature and rainfall, if I did it for sea level pressure, which I think I will do next, I'm going to skip, they're going to be all over the place. Yeah, here they are. Good. So I didn't show you all 40. Um, I think it just got so noisy. Uh, we just picked out uh, nine, nine in a row here, members 10 through uh, 18. I could show you any any set, and um, you know this one is a low, this one is a high, this one is sort of totally different pattern. They're all over the place. I'm going to get to your point next, so I'm going to show you nine panels, same color bar, same variable sea level pressure in the winter time for nine different CMIT models, one run each. And I just picked them alphabetically. <laughs> alphabetically. So here you go. Now the Australian model and the GFDL model. Beautifully opposite. 
And the question is, what do you conclude from this? And you might say, wow, uh, the, the, the structural differences in the models is just overwhelming. But I would say you cannot conclude that, because another component of why they're different could just be that the internal variability, the sequence that you sampled, was different. So we go back to the ensemble from one model. We know this is internal variability. That's the way we design the experiment. This we don't know. And so then you can start to address, OK, how big is internal variability in this ensemble by comparing amplitudes with a, with a large ensemble from one model versus this. And we've, we've done a, a bit of that. Um, and I think there's lots more to be done. But it's just to open your eyes to, to, to this kind of thing. So I'm going to skip this next part because it's just more of the same uh, points. If you're interested, you can read uh, the papers. So I'm going to skip this. So just close your eyes if it bothers you. <laughs> <laughs> I always hate when people do this. OK. So I'm going to come now to two uh, important implications. Or we've already discussed lots of them. But here's uh, so just what we've been talking about. How to interpret this multi-model archives that so many of us use in our research. So how should we compare single runs from different models? OK, so to illustrate, I'm taking two of the CMIP3 models, but I don't think the results really will be different for CMIP5. So the ECM5, this is a uh, German model, um, they actually did a very similar uh, set of uh, experiments. They ran 17 of these initial condition ensembles. And so I picked out um, number three. And this, again, 50 years trends in the future, wintertime air temperature. And then on the right here is run number 22 from the 40 runs that were done with CCSN3. OK, so again, how, how do we compare these, knowing now what we know? So you can't directly compare them. That's the number one, because in any single run realization, you have both the free and the force response. So to directly compare, you need a enough runs with the same model and the same forcing uh, to get the forced response. So we had 17 from ECM and 40 from CCSM3. I think that's enough to, to estimate the forced response. We average. And now, these are the forced responses um, between the models. And there are some differences, but you know, they're, fairly, they're much more similar than these two are, for sure. So that's how to directly compare models. But to do this, you need enough ensemble members with a single model to average out the internal variability and get the forced variability. So maybe it's kind of hopeless. Um, but I think there's ways forward. And this is newer work. And I think there's still lots to be done with this. But I was trying to convince you just you know, hand-waving qualitative ways how the atmospheric circulation variability has a lot to do with the, the differences amongst the runs with a single model. Uh, I have much more quantitative results in the papers. Uh, so you could think about, OK, what if, you know, how could we account for the fact that you know, the GFDL run had a big high pressure, and the, the CSIRO model had a big low pressure. Well, we know that just from the control runs with these models, how those pressure patterns will impact temperature and rainfall and other things. And we can account for that and, and, and subtract it, if you will. So if we knew, OK, a high pressure over the North Pacific tends to warm you know, the western part of the US by a certain amount and uh, cool it by other you know, amounts in other locations. And then we just subtract that off. That's a lot of what the internal variability is coming from. So let's do that. And then you can ask my question. And I'm not going to get into all this detail, but we call it dynamical adjustment. We take pressure patterns, 
we map them onto temperature and rainfall patterns, and then we remove that component. So here we come back to our two runs that we've been looking at, and now we subtract out just the internal part of the atmospheric circulation, what that caused. And now these two runs, again, are much more similar. Um, there are different ways of doing this. This, this shows kind of the, the, the best result. They're not always look this good, I, I can assure you. But again, it's a way maybe to, uh, to try to narrow, you know, try to get at the forced response. Um, OK. So you can ask your question. I guess by saying that you're removing the atmospheric variability, you are, are you do you think you're leaving in the ocean variability and the ice variability or the other surface boundary conditions yes, in these you, cases? Yes. Yep. Uh, yes. But yes. So there's certainly unexplained variability or that that we haven't accounted for. But I think so much of it is coming from the atmosphere circulation. Just know you've done a lot of work on air-sea interaction variability before, yeah. and it seems yeah. to be discounting some of Well, you know, the ocean, so I can tell you, um, part of the what's driving the sea level pressure changes in the North Pacific, part of it is coming from the tropical Pacific sea surface temperatures, the usual, you know, teleconnections that we get. And, um, but part of it is just not being driven by, you know, the tropics. Um, so it's some of both. But in the end, it doesn't matter, because we couldn't predict the tropical Pacific SSTs anyway. So it really doesn't really matter. Yeah. OK, so now I'll move on to uh, what I think, again, is another really important thing. And again, this is all, you know, we're still grappling with all this, these problems. Um, so how do you interpret observed trends? Um, so I'm showing you, I've been showing you results for 50 years in the future where the change in the radiative forcing, the change in the greenhouse gases is large, <laughs> much larger than what we have witnessed. So you can already maybe get a sense that I'm going <laughs> to show you how challenging it is. But again, you know, I'm, I'm really talking about if you're interested in these local scales. If you do global averages, continental averages, you know, a lot of the internal variability gets, gets uh, averaged out. So I don't have to go into detail. We did a very similar type of initial condition ensemble with a newer version of the model. And it had slightly higher uh, spatial resolution, one degree in latitude and longitude, roughly 100 kilometers. Um, and this run. This set of runs was done for the recent past, 1970 to 2005. So it's a short, short period, 30, 36 years in length. Uh, nevertheless, I think it's informative. And if you, you know, uh, think about the satellite records that we have, right, for precipitation or you know, snow cover, et cetera. That satellite record begins in 79. So again, it's only. It's roughly the same amount uh, uh, length of time. So I think it has bearing on interpreting trends uh, for you know, the last few decades. OK, so again, keep it simple. Uh, these maps for North America, again, wintertime air temperature trends. So these are linear changes over this 36-year period. And um, these are C, CCSM4. And then we had 30 runs this time, not 40. So here, and this is the observed. OK, it's been warming a lot. So I, I don't even have to draw your attention to a particular column here. Um, you know, some have, uh, I mean, they're just, it's just amazing, right? Um, they're not all warming everywhere. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Uh, and then I can show you the, the ECHM model, just because we should definitely be suspicious of any one model. Uh, so here, ECHM model had 17 runs, as I mentioned. And again, just huge differences amongst the runs. It's kind of fortuitous that the first member looks a lot like observations. <laughs> So that's kind of what we're up against. Now again, lengthening the time period. If you go back to 1900, 
then of course, you know, the force component will be bigger, will get bigger and bigger relative to the internal. But if you're trying to interpret changes over a few decades, um, a component may certainly be due to changes in greenhouse gases and, and other uh, radiative forcings. But be very mindful that um, there's also a lot of internal variability. Um, so let's see what comes next. Yeah, so what comes next, and I, almost done here. So just contrasting these two runs, because they're so different. Um, so on the left, these are the wintertime uh, uh, air temperature changes, and then the sea level pressure changes in the contours. And all the color scales and contours uh, intervals are uh, uniform between the, the different plots. So I put observations. Uh, obviously, I chose this run for a reason. Um, it has the low, or it has a, a tendency towards uh, lower pressure. Uh, somewhat reminiscent of the observed pattern. And then the warming pattern over uh, in this run also looks a little bit like what we've witnessed. Uh, so then, obviously, I picked run number 24 for obvious reasons. Uh, you get you, This one had uh, higher pressure uh, change toward higher pressures over the North Pacific, and actually a lot of cooling um, over uh, the west, northwestern part of North America. So then um, I performed this taking out the, empirically removing the effects of these circulation changes. And I haven't gone into the details of how I've done it. but um, And so then what you find is that some of the observed warming is it's obviously reduced. You still have warming everywhere, but it's reduced. And then in each of these runs, uh, you know, there's, um, they certainly, these, these panels look a lot more alike, the lower set of maps, when I account for this internal variability of the atmospheric circulation than the top panels. This is the forced response. This is the average of all 30 runs. This is what, let's just say, greenhouse gases for simplicity. In this model, this is how uh, temperature and sea level pressure respond to the greenhouse gas changes. Almost no contours, right, for sea level pressure. So there's very so all of the contours on here must be internal, internal variability. And then you get this familiar pattern of poleward amplified warming. And these maps here look more like the forced response than they did before we accounted for the effects of the atmospheric circulation. So now I'll show this to you uh, in, a, in a, yeah. So this is the same type of map now from single runs of 44, I think it was, CMIP 5 models. So once again, you know, there's real diversity in the sign, the amplitude of the trends. And some of this could be model differences, and some of this could be internal. I, I'm not going to show that. So now, last last slides, I think. Uh, just um, just to show it to you a little differently. So uh, these are the histograms of the temperature trends averaged over uh, all land points over North America. So the observed trend is, I think it was 1.76 degrees uh, over this last 30, uh, this 36 year period. So we had warming of that magnitude. The gray bars are the, the percentage of the runs in the single model, CCSM4, uh, that had warming of a certain uh, magnitude here. So there's a distribution, right? And uh, the observations lies on the high end, but it certainly does lie within that distribution. Then the red bars are doing that average now from each of the CMIP5 models. Single run, different models. And it just, it's quite interesting, <laughs> the spread, you know, across the multi-model ensemble is very similar to the spread due to internal variability in one model. 
But on the face of it, it's saying a lot of the spread in the CMIP archive for this particular thing I'm showing you is due to internal variability. But of course, the internal variability in one model may be different from that in another model. So I can't quite uh, make that, that statement. Then we perform this dynamical adjustment. And this is work in progress. And it's not, you know, I'm not, it, I'm not fully uh, confident uh, or vetted in uh, that the results are, you know, but I think uh, they're, they're, they're going to stand up to, you know, experimenting with the, with the methodology. But you saw this before. This was the dynamically adjusted uh, part of the warming. So now look at where the green bar is. So the observed warming actually was reduced. 40% of it, I am claiming, is actually not forced. Yeah, it's a lot. And you can see that the magnitude really goes down. And then you can see that it still lies within these model ensembles. And you can see how the, the range has narrowed when we account for the internal variability of the atmospheric circulation. So I'm excited about these results. I think they are you know, incredibly important um, for how we interpret changes in you know, over short time periods. Um, we really have to be mindful of the internal variability. And this is a grid box uh, where happens uh, Seattle lies within this grid box. Um, I think I was giving a talk there. That's why I picked that grid box. So now you can see the spread is much greater than it was for North America as a whole. You can also see that the observed trend lies well within these models. Uh, uh, it looks very small, right? I mean, the observed, it goes down. Oh, uh, I think probably similar. That's a good question. Yeah, the range here is what? It looks like it goes from 0 to 1.5 or something. 0. 0.5 to 2, not, not too different. Not too different. Yep. Yep, it works very well. So I don't have results on this. I mean, I have some, but you know, this is this is an enormously important and challenging problem. <laughs> and I don't really have good answers. I think we really have to think of, uh, I'm not sure you know, how best to go about this. And I'm just going to skip these maps. But um, well, so we'd like, to, we'd like to look at these, you know, if we had long observed records, we'd like to look at 35-year trends in these records and see you know, what the spread is amongst 35-year trends. But of course, we don't have long enough records to do that. So the only thing I could sort of think about doing was to, to look at some low-pass filter data and then plot the magnitudes of, of the variability on time scales longer than a decade and to compare models with, with observations. And you can look at these in the papers. Um, I don't think the models are too far off, <laughs> is what I would say here. Then I'm going to just um, kind of advertise tool, two tools that we've been developing in the climate analysis section, uh, where I uh, am. And the first is called the Climate Variability Diagnostics Package. It's a, it's a tool that uh, facilitates uh, the computation of these, uh, if you want, modes of vari climate variability in observations and in models. Uh, so we compute you know, different metrics of El Nino, uh, the North Atlantic Oscillation, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. We just picked sort of the leading, leading ones. And uh, these, uh, they're very easy. This package is like super easy to use, very quick. And what's really nice is you get um, uh, very nice graphics, but you can also save these indices uh, to just net CDF files. So you can, you can run this for whatever time period, whatever set of models you want. And then you can get the output. Uh, you can get the Nino 3.4 index. You can get the PDO index. And then you'll have that time series. And then you can do what you will with it. 
So it's a very nice, uh, just to facilitate, uh, you know, people's analyses. I'll show you uh, one of my favorite plots that comes out of this, but I really encourage you to, to go to this website. And we're also, um, you know, thinking of next steps for this particular tool. And if there's any indices that, you know, you would find particularly valuable, please just email me and, uh, you know, I'd love to hear what, what's useful uh, to, to uh, users and from all, all communities. So this is an example of uh, running the Pacific Decadal Oscillation Analysis on all 44 CMIP-5 models. It took about a half hour on the, on the whole 20th century runs. And observations is up here. You can't see the labels, but this tells you the time period that you chose, 1900 to 2005. This happens to be an EOF analysis, which is a little bit you know, time consuming and a little bit tricky sometimes. It tells you the percent variance that's explained by this particular mode. And, and then it gives you the patterns for each of the models. And they're, they're, the name of the model is on here. And at a glance, you can see how well does your model simulate, you know, the pattern that's been observed. And it's a very useful tool. And then we have a metrics table that then assesses uh, we do pattern correlations between the models and the observed pattern. And that's one entry into our metrics table. And then we do this over many things. And so uh, the NAO, et cetera. And then you sort of can get a feel for how well the model does overall uh, by averaging all of the, the metrics entries in this metrics table. So I very much encourage you to visit this site and give us some feedback. We'd love to have it. Then the next question is, you know, how reliable are the observations? What are the, you know, what are the issues, known issues with data sets? So we have another project uh, called the Climate Data Guide. And this is a little more mature, a little bit farther along um, as a project. And again, I really uh, would, would love it if uh, this, you found this uh, to be useful in your work. So this is really. Uh, you know, a community project. We're just asking uh, people who use and develop data sets what they know about, you know, problems, uh, you know, non-climatic issues with data sets. Are there, are there jumps in the data? Are there inhomogeneities? Are there, you know, issues with, with uh, coverage, spatial coverage, et cetera? And so we're really trying to collect the kind of uh, collective wisdom of, of the community and just get them uh, written up here. So again, feedback on this would be wonderful. So that's it. Um, I think, uh, you know, this idea that we're not going to see any single future, <laughs> uh, you know, single pattern or magnitude of future change, we should expect this range uh, just because of internal variability especially due to, uh, due to the uh, atmospheric uh, circulation. So I hope I've convinced you of that. And then I also think that we do need these large initial condition ensembles for many different models. I think um, it's very important for a whole bunch of reasons. And then, <clears throat> you know, I focused here on North America. Um, it doesn't mean that other places look, you know, as as uh, as uh, unpredictable as as North America. So it's important to look at other regions. And then the final thing is we have a whole new set of runs that really finished a month ago, and uh, this is done with the very newest version, the Community Earth System model. Again, at one degree, it's a 30-member ensemble. And the nice thing about this one is that it spans a, law, a large portion of the 20th century. So you can go back to you know, understand the observed trends. And then it goes out. Actually, we've extended most of the members out to 2100. So again, this is a resource that we've uh, run here at NCAR. And it's on behalf of uh, the entire you know, global community of, uh, of scientists. So uh, you're very welcome to access the data. Thank you.